When people ask why I became a housing activist, I always give my stock answer. A friend recommended a book on housing policy, and I discovered that housing advocacy aligned perfectly with my values. This is all true, but it's not the full story. I'm way too embarrassed to admit that I got into housing because of a guy. <laughs> After my relationship of nine years ended, I was determined to be happily single. It was really easy at first because I was in no rush to go through that again. After nine months of healing though, I was kind of ready to start maybe thinking about dating. There was a problem, however, I have an overwhelming preference for people who present as masculine, and so many of them are, well, straight cis men. <laughs> what if I accidentally dated someone who wasn't a feminist, or who believed in gender roles, or who wasn't completely cool with queerness? Ugh, I'd rather stay single than deal with that. <laughs> People I already knew felt less risky than random guys, but I didn't have any prospects. So I decided to flip through my mental Rolodex of past crushes. <laughs> After a couple of false starts, I got to Ben. I'd met Ben in an undergrad writing seminar and had really liked the way he thought. I'm on the asexual spectrum, and I find few things more attractive than intellect. I remembered Ben had this way of looking at me. Was it possible that he'd been interested too? I learned from LinkedIn that he'd gotten a graduate degree in environmental policy and now worked in analytics. Huh. <laughs> On top of that, he ditched his wire frames for hipster glasses and traded the clean shaven look for scruffy facial hair. And my goodness, was it ever working for him. I found his Instagram and got to work. There were hundreds of beautiful pictures with sentimental captions, including annual year-end reflections. He was definitely my type. <laughs> he no longer lived in San Diego, but this wasn't a problem. I had years of experience developing and maintaining online friendships. Also, I had tickets to an event in the city where he was living now. I had the perfect plan. I'd get in touch, I'd feel things out, and then one day I'd catch usually mentioned that I was going to be in the area and ask if you wanted to meet up. My internet sleuthing hadn't revealed any signs of a partner, so it was full steam ahead. I was going to go for it. I commented on his recent World Cat Day post, yes. <laughs> <laughs> remarking that it sounded like he had a wonderful companion. Strangely, he didn't seem ecstatic to hear from me, so he must not have realized who I was. My profile pic was my dog, after all. <laughs> it was time to kick things up a notch. It was time for DMs. <laughs> I fired off a flirtatious message. I asked him to tell me about his hobbies. I quickly learned that Ben was a fellow aquarium nerd, houseplant nerd, and Lord of the Rings nerd. We geeked out so hard. At one point, we were trying to decide which elven kingdom we'd like to live in, and Ben pointed out that one of them wouldn't pass an OSHA inspection. <laughs> this was the nerdiest thing that I'd ever heard, and one of the hottest. <laughs> it was official. I was nuts about this guy. I was dancing through life, high out of my mind thanks to the neurotransmitters flooding my system. I cooked, I cleaned, I was unstoppable. After we'd been messaging for a few months, still without having met up, I finally worked up the courage to tell Ben that this wasn't strictly platonic for me. Unfortunately, he didn't feel the same way. My talent for finding genuinely nice guys who just wanted to be friends was as strong as ever. I told Ben I needed to disappear for a while to recalibrate, but I'd be back. But my plan to get over Ben didn't work. I was dying to hear his professional takes on sustainability, and cutting off contact with him didn't make me want that any less. Ben was doing such incredibly cool things, and I had this feeling that if I stuck around, 
I'd end up doing really cool things too. I was well aware that I was probably hurtling headfirst towards heartbreak, but I was convinced that it would be worth it. One day, Ben posted about how highways had been used to impose residential segregation. I told Ben I needed to learn more, and he recommended a book called The Color of Law. I wanted to check it out, but getting into something because of a guy felt so cliche. My friends reassured me that if I was going to go down rabbit holes because of romance, I could do worse than housing policy. <laughs> so I dove in. Ben had previously mentioned that housing was a big focus of his environmental activism. I couldn't imagine what the connection was or why he'd be so passionate about something that seemed so boring. Thanks to the book, I realized that housing was the perfect intersection of social justice and environmentalism, my two passions. I'd always had this borderline pathological drive to save the world, and teaching high school science had previously fulfilled that need. Now that I was a happy corporate sellout, my day job wasn't cutting it, and I'd been looking for something to pour my heart into. I told Ben that I cared a lot about the issues presented in the book and wanted to make a difference. If you want to make a difference, he said, join Yimby Democrats of San Diego. <laughs> awesome, a pre-vetted organization. But what the heck was a Yimby? The book hadn't talked about that. Google told me it stands for yes in my backyard. The opposite of NIMBY. I was sold. Now, when I get into something, I really get into it. So I immediately joined two committees. Just a few weeks after I began learning about housing, the club urged everyone to speak at city council in favor of a housing initiative. I'd always been too intimidated to speak on the record, but I was ready to change that. My heart rate skyrocketed as I was speaking, but I did it. I gave public comment. <laughs> Next, Ben encouraged me to try canvassing, as in going door to door, talking to voters. Um, as a child, I'd found trick-or-treating unbearably awkward. <laughs> and people actually like cute kids in costume. My desire to impress Ben motivated me to give canvassing a shot anyway. Much to my surprise, I absolutely loved it. And I noticed myself becoming more outgoing and willing to risk rejection in general. Between city council, campaigning, and community planning groups, my calendar was filling up. Ben and I would eagerly compare notes on housing drama in our respective cities, and it was uncanny how these neighborhood battles followed the same script, despite happening hundreds of miles apart. I had tons of questions about housing, and Ben was always happy to answer. Ben's enthusiasm for my activism was incredibly motivating. In addition to discussing housing, we had all the good conversations about sustainability that I dreamt of. We were on the same intellectual wavelength, and connecting with someone like that felt incredible. One day, we were talking about the scope creep of language, and Ben sent me an article about how the term emotional labor had expanded far beyond its original definition. Did I ever have opinions on that? Our discussion of that article led us to open up about our exes, our families, our lives. After months of strictly academic discourse, this signified a major shift in our relationship. Ben had always seemed so incredibly put together, and I'd worried that once he learned about the messier parts of my past, he'd look down on me. Turns out that his life hadn't been perfect either, and I had no reason to fear judgment. The more we opened up, the stronger my bond to him grew. I was dying to hug him already. After communicating exclusively through Instagram DMs for seven months, I was finally visiting Ben's city. I expected to absolutely dazzle him. <laughs> in an ironic twist, I quickly realized I wasn't actually romantically attracted to him in person. It started with the hug. He gave me one of those pat, 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 pat hugs. And I'd read enough body language articles to immediately know that he wasn't feeling this. Once we got to talking, it became clear that the chemistry just wasn't quite right. 
There was a disconnect between how I imagined him when I read his messages and how he actually came through in person. All of that being said, I had a lot of fun at lunch with him and I hoped we could start talking over Zoom soon. <laughs> a few weeks after my trip, I DM Ben to tell him about my first in-person Yimby Dems meeting. Three days went by and my messages were still unread. Oh right, he told me he was gonna be cutting back on Instagram. I reached out again, this time by text message, saying I hoped that all was well and including some pictures of ferns. Surely he couldn't resist his favorite plant. <laughs> Several more days went by. Nothing. I anxiously sent another message asking if everything was okay. And this time, he replied nearly instantly. Phew. Ben apologized for the delay and proceeded to tell me that he'd realized he needed to step away from our friendship. Wait, what? Shit, no. What was happening? This couldn't, what was going on? <sighs> ben explained that he didn't find being extended pen pals rewarding. Wait, hold on. Ben had always told me how much he looked forward to updates on all my projects. He told me he was excited to reply to my messages. He told me things he'd never shared with anyone else. How could he not have found what we had rewarding? <laughs> ben then emphasized that he was thrilled that I'd grown as a result of our conversations. Thrilled. Thrilled? Thrilled? If he found this so fucking thrilling, why didn't he want me in his life anymore? I never wanted to hear the word thrilled again. He concluded by wishing me the best and unfollowing me. Just a month earlier, he would told me that if our lunch plans conflicted with a long-awaited backpacking trip, he'd choose lunch with me. And now this? <sighs> the armchair psychologist in me had some theories to why he'd behaved so drastically, and I knew it was a him problem, not a me problem, but that didn't make this hurt any less. <sighs> I went through a long, messy grieving process, literally. For months, I'd been doing an amazing job staying on top of cooking and cleaning. All that went out the window. I couldn't even take long walks through my neighborhood because walking time was thinking time and I'd inevitably fixate on my loss. It took me over a month to start feeling like myself again. And during that time, I found my enthusiasm for activism waning. <sighs> with Ben out of my life, I really needed new people to geek out about housing with. I started chatting with the local Yimbis, first online, and then in our meetings, I was frustratingly afraid to introduce myself to people at first, but after a couple of months, I got the hang of things. By the time our summer fundraiser rolled around, I couldn't wait to mingle, and I was gonna look good doing it. I got my hair cut, I got my brows done, I put on my best dress, and when I got there, I worked that room. Everyone wanted to talk to me, and I ate it up. <laughs> Just eight months before, I hadn't known anything about housing. I hadn't known any of these people. And there I was, surrounded by friends, beaming as the Yimby Dems president praised the dedication and enthusiasm of the Volunteer of the Year. <laughs> me. Rachel Graham, everybody, Rachel Graham.